Hey, it's Chris. You're here because you want to know which iPad you should buy. I'm here because I've got all the iPads and not only information about them, but a bunch of useful experience and opinions to share. So we're going to talk about things like how much storage do you need? Which chip should you get? Which port do you need? What size? What kind of display? 5G or Wi-Fi? And by the way, before we get in too deep, I got a quick announcement. The Daily Tech Podcast is back. It comes out Fridays and it's all kinds of good stuff about Apple, me, just hanging out. If you want to brighten up your week, make sure to check it out. Get subscribed. Also subscribe to the Clips channel because that's the only place where you can watch the podcast clips. All right. So just in case you're short on time, let me give you some quick recommendations and kind of break down all the options in just a few seconds. This is an iPad Pro. iPad Pro start at $799. And generally speaking, you should get one if you want a top of the line iPad experience and you want the best possible tech and money is no object. This is the iPad Air, which starts at $599, comes in a variety of fun colors. This is the blue one. And generally speaking, this is the iPad you should get if you either don't need or can't afford the absolute best iPad experience, but you still want a great iPad experience and you still wanna be able to make use of most of the best accessories. This is the iPad Mini, which starts at $499, which you should generally get if you want basically the best of the current tech at the lowest price you can get it, or if you just like the smaller form factor. And this, is the regular iPad, which starts at 329. And this one you should generally get if you need what I call the minimum viable iPad experience, or if you're just straight up trying to save some money. And honestly, whichever one you end up choosing, if you're gonna use an Apple Pencil, I'd highly recommend picking up a paper like screen protector, like I'm using here on my 12.9 inch, because it's honestly one of my all time favorite iPad accessories. And I get so many comments from people saying, thanks for recommending it because they love it too. Now I put some chapter markers in, so if you just wanna skip around to the section that's most relevant to you, you can, but there's a few things that I have to get off my chest first. Number one, I think it's absolutely false for somebody to say that a certain iPad is for creating while another iPad or iPads are not. They're just for consuming. Because the truth is that all of these iPads can be used to either create or to consume. It just depends on the configuration that you go with and the accessories that you use. iPads by default right out of the box are magical slabs of glass that act as windows that we can look through into the digital realm. But as soon as you add some creative tools, an Apple Pencil, a keyboard, creative apps, then these devices become not just windows into the digital realm, but windows into your own mind and creativity, and you can unleash your creativity into the digital realm. So it's obvious that you can consume content on any of these devices, but I also think it's wrongheaded to say that the regular iPad or the iPad mini, for instance, can't be used for creativity. That's wrong. The second important concept that I wanna put out there for you before you make a buying decision is that this is a game of trade-offs. So if you get a smaller iPad, there's gonna be times when you wish you had gotten a larger iPad. If you get the most expensive iPad, there's gonna be times when you wish that maybe you had spent a little bit less and vice versa. So the real question today is what trade-offs are worth it for you. All right, so let's talk about which display and which size is right for you. Now, if you go with a 12.9 inch iPad Pro like this one I've got sitting here, you're gonna be a little bit more immersed in your work or your entertainment than if you go with the smallest iPad, obviously, but also if you want the best HDR content experience, you're also gonna need the 12.9 inch Pro because it's the only one that has the right mini LED configuration to make the most of the brightness coming off of HDR content. That said, the trade-offs are that it costs a lot more and it's also heavier, it's bigger. It's gonna take up more space on your desk and in a bag. And you also have an in-between set of options with the 11 inch Pro, which I don't have here, the 10.9 inch Air, which is this blue one, and then the 10.2 inch regular iPad. So not too big, not too small, but I think there's a reason why Apple has so many in-between sizes because I think it's really the sweet spot between 10 and 11 inches for most people. Now the 12.9 inch iPad Pro, yes, has a mini LED display, but it also has 120 hertz ProMotion. Well, what's ProMotion? It gives you double the refresh rate of a 60 hertz display, which means things like smoother scrolling, greater responsiveness, and then things like better gaming performance. So you gotta ask yourself, are those things important to you? And it's important to point out the 11 inch doesn't have the XDR capabilities, the HDR capabilities of the 12.9 inch, but it does still have ProMotion. So what is the XDR on the 12.9? Well, it's for high dynamic range content, HDR content. So brighter brights, more vivid photos and videos, better looking details. So it's for Dolby Vision, HDR10, and HLG content. Now the iPad Air has the same display quality as the 11 inch Pro, but it lacks that ProMotion. So 
no 120 hertz display. The Mini also has the same display tech as the Air, it's just smaller. And some people end up noticing a jelly scrolling effect. You might even be able to see it here. And if you can't see it, that might bug you. Other people can't notice it or just don't care at all. Personally, I do notice it. I feel like it's not a huge deal. You know, I love the Mini, I love its size, how it handles, and so it wouldn't keep me from buying it. But honestly, I would prefer that it wasn't there. Now the regular iPad 9 here, it only has a retina display. So it's not quite as good as the Mini or the Air, which have liquid retina displays. What does that really mean? Well, this has sharper corners and these are rounded. And if you can notice anything other than that, then you tell me. And the last thing you're gonna notice is just the bezels. So that's it for the displays, but how do you choose between the size? The, the general rule of thumb that I usually tell people is if I'm gonna be using this mostly at a desk and I'm not gonna be too mobile, then I usually opt for a larger sized iPad. On the other hand, if I know I'm gonna be out and mobile or doing a lot of traveling, then I usually opt for a smaller sized iPad. Just a quick reminder, if you're liking the vibe of this video, hit subscribe, because I can see in the stats, a lot of people are watching that aren't subscribers, and I don't want you to miss out. Don't forget to subscribe to the Clips channel and the podcast as well, because there's lots of daily tech content, lots of content from me that you're gonna miss out on if you don't. All right, let's talk a little bit about ports, because I think this is something that actually doesn't get talked about enough. The regular iPad 9 is the only iPad out now that still has a lightning port. What does that mean? Well, it's gonna let you charge, not as quickly as other iPads, and also you're not gonna have as many accessories available. Now the iPad mini and the iPad Air both have a USB-C connector, which means both the mini and the Air are gonna be able to take advantage of some really cool accessories. So things like a really useful USB-C hub, and I'll link up a clip to one that I just covered recently. And then you can also take advantage of some really great external storage options. The iPad Pros definitely kick it up a notch in the port department, and that's because they have support for Thunderbolt and USB 4. Why should you care? Well, Thunderbolt's gonna be up to four times faster. So if you're a pro and time really is money, then transferring a huge file four times faster, maybe at the office, maybe out in the field, that can make a big difference. And I should point out that Thunderbolt's been available for Macs for a while now, but the ability to have Thunderbolt on a nice light mobile iPad that takes up a lot less space when you're bringing it with you on the road, for instance, that's a big deal. That is a game changer for some people. Plus, there's just some really cool Thunderbolt accessories that you can take advantage of. So Elgato has a really nice compact Thunderbolt dock. There's the LG Ultrafine display. That's a Thunderbolt compatible display. CalDigit also has the TS3 Thunderbolt dock, and that's super powerful. And then, of course, there's Samsung's X5 drive, which is a Thunderbolt drive. It's an external SSD, and it flies. It's so fast. It's compact. It looks good. And I'll link all these things up for you down in the description. All right, let's talk a little bit about iPad storage. How much do you need? So across all the different iPad models, you can go from as little as 64 gigs of storage all the way up to a whopping two terabytes. With the regular iPad 9, the mini, and the Air, you can get between 64 gigs and 256 gigs. So not a whole lot of options or wiggle room down on the bottom three-fourths of Apple's lineup. But on the pro side of things, you have more options. 128 gigs, 256, 512, one terabyte, or two terabytes. Now here's a general rule of thumb you should keep in mind. Apple's internal storage is always gonna cost you more than if you're willing to go external. If you buy external storage, the same amount of storage, it's gonna be a lot cheaper if you hook up an external drive than if you upgrade the storage internally right here on this order page. So this is interesting. iMore actually has a really interesting chart that breaks down what you pay per gigabyte based on which iPad option you go with. So take the 11 inch iPad Pro for instance. You're gonna end up paying $6.24 per gigabyte if you get the lowest tier 128 option. And that number actually goes down from 624 per gig to just 94 cents per gig if you upgrade to the two terabyte option. So it's kind of like buying in bulk. If you buy more of something, then you end up paying less per unit. Well, it's the same here. You buy more gigs from Apple, you're gonna pay less per gig, but you're still gonna end up paying more overall. Does that make sense? All right, so practical advice. If you're planning on just doing some basic tablet stuff, checking your email, doing some web browsing, some light gaming, for instance, then you know what? The lowest storage amount is probably gonna be fine for you, great even. And of course, if you are trying to save some money, you can expand some of your storage into the cloud. Not for everything, but a lot of it, you can offload. On the other hand, if you're the type of person who's gonna have a lot of apps, and particularly a lot of games, then I think going with the 256 gig option is definitely gonna be more up your alley. Now, if you're doing some graphics heavy work, like some heavy duty photo and video editing, then I think it's time to start looking at at least 
512 gigs. Because look, ProRes, even the ProRes that you can shoot on an iPhone now, makes for some huge, huge files. You'll be surprised how quickly your storage will disappear. Now, the one terabyte and the two terabyte options, those are probably best for developers, music engineers, maybe graphic designers. So this is why I'm saying things like photos, videos, stuff you're gonna stream, you can put that in the cloud, but a lot of your files, especially app specific files that you need to access and access quickly for your read write times, those have to be local. I definitely think, again, if you're a video editor and be working with a lot of 4K footage, LumaFusion lets you do multiple camera angles now so you can really load it up with a lot of footage. Or if you're in, let's say, Affinity Photo and you're really gonna be loading up or procreate a bunch of different layers, you know, and you're gonna have multiple projects with a bunch of layers and a lot of assets inside, these are situations where you're not gonna wanna skimp on your storage. So let's talk about iPad chips, the power, the guts, there's currently three different chips that you can choose from in the whole iPad lineup. You've got an A13 in the iPad 9, you've got an A15 in the iPad mini, and then both the Air and the Pros have the new M1 processor. So let's work our way back a little bit. The M1 chip that's in both the Air and the Pros is actually a desktop class chip. You're gonna find it in the MacBook Air and the Mac mini and also in the new iMac. And I'm just gonna tell you, the M1 chip right now is basically absolute overkill if you're just doing things like web browsing, checking your email, and even doing light photo and video editing. Almost nobody's gonna be able to make the M1 even break a sweat with their iPad workflow. Maybe somebody who's doing a crazy CAD render, maybe, maybe somebody who's editing multiple 4K video streams in LumaFusion. Other than that, all I can really say about the M1 is that it's probably gonna stay feeling fresh and snappy for several years to come. Now the iPad mini's A15 processor is not desktop class. What it is, is the same processor that you're gonna find in the iPhone 13. So I guess you could call it phone class. What's interesting is that the A15 is still basically absolute overkill for people who are doing web browsing or streaming some content, checking their email, and some light photo and video editing. So again, most people are still not gonna be able to make the A15 break a sweat, most people. And then there's the A13 and the regular iPad 9, and it's the same processor from the iPhone 11. And honestly, it's gonna outperform the chip in other low-cost tablets, so it's definitely not bottom of the barrel, even if it's the worst chip in this lineup. Does that make sense? So still, for your average everyday tasks, it's gonna be plenty of power. And honestly, at the end of the day, if you really need more power than you can get in either the mini or the regular iPad 9 or even the iPad Air, then you already know it, right? If you have to ask if you're a pro, then you're probably not, so don't worry about it. All right, so what about cellular versus Wi-Fi? 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi. Well, I made a clip about this that has over 200,000 views, so let's revisit it because this is obviously something that people are wondering about. Right, do you see these lines at the top of the mini and the air and the pro? These are antenna lines. That's because I've got the cellular versions of these iPads. Now I hear from people all the time that they feel like buying a cellular version is such a waste, so pointless, because Wi-Fi is pretty much everywhere, it's ubiquitous, and you can just tether to your iPhone's hotspot. Now I'm actually pretty agnostic one way or another. I don't care what you wanna do with your money, but I will just point out, right, I'll be devil's advocate here for a second, that yes, you can tether to your hotspot on your iPhone, but that's gonna drain two things, your battery, quicker, and your data. So keep that in mind. Also, it's not really what you would consider a best practice, is it, to connect to a bunch of unsecured public Wi-Fi networks. You know, do you really wanna be looking at those secure documents, for instance, on the public Wi-Fi? And on top of that, there's public Wi-Fi spots that can be really congested, or they can just have a slow connection. I would say it's nice to use a hotspot and tether from time to time, maybe in short bursts, but if it's something that you're gonna be doing a lot of, then it might be worth the investment to get a cellular connection. It's nice to have the option anyways, if you can afford it. Of course, it's gonna cost maybe 100 to 150 extra for that ability, just to have the option to turn that plan on or off month to month, so. The other thing I just wanna point out is a lot of cars these days are actually Wi-Fi enabled and have hotspots built in, so you don't wanna be redundant. All right, so hopefully you found this video useful. If you're still confused which iPad you should get, go back to the beginning of the video and watch my quick recommendations right at the beginning there because I think that really does a great job of just helping you make a snap decision. But it is hard to go wrong because the iPad, any iPad, is a powerful, awesome 
device. So thanks for hanging out today. Don't forget that I've linked up the podcast, the Daily Tech Podcast, down in the description. So if you want to listen to it while you're doing the chores, walking your dog, or you're just driving around in the car, again, that comes out on Fridays. And don't forget, if you want to watch the podcast clips, there's only one place to do that. It's on the Daily Tech Clips channel. That's linked up down below too. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Later.